Hello, 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 hello. I've got in the habit of saying hello a lot because it takes a while for the audio to settle down. Very nice. Uh, if you're joining us, thank you so much. Most people who consume this show actually don't join us live, but it is very, very nice that some of you take your time out of your day. Maybe you've just got us on in the kind of background, but you're listening in anyway. I really appreciate it. If you, um, if you would like to share the show, Probably this is the, the easiest way to do that. If you go to wpbuilds.com forward slash live, um, you could share that URL. I'd really appreciate that. In fact, goodness me, I'm going to say it. Just put down what you're doing and uh, go and find that URL, wpbuilds.com forward slash live and share it with your friends. We'd really appreciate that. Um, if you are here and you would like to make a comment, we endeavor to put as many of them on the screen as we possibly can. It's not always the case that we can get them all on, but where we can, we will. Um, sadly, the uh, the vagaries of the internet mean that we've got to you've got to go through a little step if you want to do that. So, for example, if you're over at wpbuilds.com forward slash live, you'll need to be logged into Google because it's over that, that we're showing the YouTube feed over there, and obviously Google owns YouTube. But if you're on Facebook, you have to go through an additional step because, goodness me, they actually protect your privacy in some way. Shouldn't have said that. Lawyers on the phone right now. Um, they <laughs> prevent us from seeing your avatar and username unless you go through this little step of going to chat.vstream.io forward slash FB. So if you want to do that, then we can see who you are. You can, of course, remain anonymous. Some people get over the facts of doing that just by adding their name uh, as the first part of their little comment. But either way... Let's hope that some people join us today and make a little comment. That would be really nice. We are joined um, by my co-host today, Michelle Frechette. How are you doing, Michelle? I'm good. How are you? Yeah, Michelle was telling us about what it's like where she is at the moment. Where where I am, the weather is typically sort of grey and a bit chilly. But where you are, it's kind of fun, if if that's the right so word. So there's a church in the building behind us. So you can see that window that's really bright behind me over here. Um, and they plow everything towards this end where our window is. And if you just sit, at, you know, even if you stand and look at it, it's reminiscent of Game of Thrones wall, like the wall. <laughs> like, you can't see the building behind me. It's plowed so high. It's probably six or seven feet high full of snow. So it does make you feel a little like a little overwhelmed. But yeah, yeah there's... Uh, we're talking about snow, of course, the fact that it's yes. you know, mi miles and miles of snow. So anyway, Michelle, lovely to have you. Do you want to do your own introduction, uh, considering Certainly. that you're the co-host? Tell, tell us who you are and whatnot. I am the director of community engagement at Stellar WP, where I get to work with all the Stellar brands. Um, and that's over at Liquid Web. And then I also I'm co-host here every so often. I have a podcast called WP Coffee Talk and another with Allie Nimmons over at underrepresentedintech.com. And I am also um, the director of community relations at Post Status, as well as the president of the board at Big Orange Heart. Uh I know, bets sort of Massive like... Massive amount. Uh, yeah, I know, exactly. Every time I kind of go through that process and Michelle explains what she does, I honestly think, honestly, if I tried to do a quarter of that, I would be totally overwhelmed. So, Michelle, I don't know where you find the time for all of this, but I very much appreciate you um, you being with us. All the coffee. Yeah, I yeah, 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 it it's is all it the is, coffee. There's no, yeah. I've never ordered a small coffee in my entire life. <laughs> it's a conveyor belt. <laughs> A conveyor belt of coffee that keeps I, I was thinking there's a reason Superwoman is her <laughs> We're also joined by two other guests. We've got Bet Hannon. I'm going to do Bet first just because I can see her name on my show notes right there. Bet has worked with businesses and nonprofits for over 15 years, helping them build WordPress websites, integrate other communication channels, and learn how to use digital marketing tools more effectively. She's the owner and CEO of BH Business Websites that design, build, and maintain access websites, more on that later, including membership and e-commerce sites. She lives in Bend, Oregon, and is the co-organizer of the WP Meetup there. Bend, Oregon. It sounds yep. like you must be near a river. Uh, yes, the okay. Deschutes River is there, but I'm actually not there today. Today I'm in southern Illinois, where we had a grandbaby born on Friday, and I, we've been helping out with all of that. So if How's you, that? I, look, I look a little sleepy. Oh, there's nothing that beats holding tiny humans. It's oh. just... <laughs> <laughs> the 
<laughs> Especially so nice. when, you know, you, you know, you're not on the hook for 18 to 25 years. Oh, yes. yes, yes <laughs> Hand them back yes. when it's time to eat. And, yeah. Something remarkable about that. Oh, yeah. oh, that's such nice news. Congratulations to you and everybody that, that needs to be congratulated there. That's brilliant. Oh, lovely, lovely. Well, I'm staggered that you've managed to find time in your busy schedule uh, in that case. Well, you know, it's, it's kind of a cool thing when you have a work where you can just pick up and move to anywhere in the world to be with family and for you whatever what? reason. And you know, you are really so cool. right. We should count ourselves incredibly lucky, that. shouldn't we? Yeah, you're right. And last, but by absolute no means least, we mm-hmm. have, uh, we've got Tiffany Bridge. Tiffany is the product manager for WordPress e-commerce at Nexus. That's all she's written, but it's, I don't know if there's more to add to that, Tiffany, but very nice to have you with mm-hmm. us. I, you know, I, that's all of the time I spend thinking about WordPress as opposed to Michelle, who I think maybe dreams about WordPress. <laughs> <laughs> no comment. No comment. Well, uh, thank you so much to all three of you for coming on. We, this is probably one of the, well, how to describe it? There's a real focus to this week because normally there's like a hodgepodge of different stories, which we will cover. But there was a, you know, a great big event that happened during the last week. And of course, we're talking Did about... something happened last week? Yeah, something happened last mm. week. Do you know what? In some, in some senses, because... Because of the giant build-up that I've been thinking about for for such a long time, we are, of course, talking about WordPress 5.9 coming along. It kind of almost happened without a great deal of fanfare for me because I've been expecting it for so long. And then I was quite, you know, I kind of almost forgot that it was going to happen because I've been waiting for it to happen. You know, it was supposed to happen last year and then it didn't. And the date came and went. And Anyway, but there's lots to talk about. So let's get on with that. Uh, this is our website, wpbuilds.com. I don't know why I put that up first, but I will move along. So there's two or three different pieces covering broadly the same thing. Um, I am assuming that the pronunciation of WordPress 5.9 is Josephine, but I have seen variants of Josephine, some with French accents on it, which means that maybe I'm butchering the name and it ought to be said in some sort of slightly more slightly more clever way, but that's what I'm going to call it, 5.9 Josephine. I hope that everything that you clicked update on, updated with nary a worry and nothing balked and died. Certainly that was the case for me. Just before we get stuck into what's in it, do you guys click the update button like right away or do you have like a two-day, three-day, five-hour little waiting period before you dare? So we manage over 150 sites. I never click the update button right away. Um, But I often will wait and see at least a few hours to see what's popping up in the support tickets and the uh, WordPress.org support forums uh, and what kinds of issues are coming up. And then we start very slowly uh, updating our sandbox sites and then updating some client sites that are very simple. And uh, and then as we don't see problems, we gradually roll things out to everybody. Right. Okay. So it's a very, very sort of considered approach. Uh-huh. Yeah. Uh, my, my technique was always to have a local website with a few of my chosen plugins that seem to get on every website. And I would update that locally and see if anything looked amiss and I've been, yeah. honestly, no problems for, for my nope. WordPress updating. I've been incredibly nope. lucky. And a big piece of that is preparing for us and, you know, knowing what's coming out in the update and what might be likely to break and, uh, you know, just doing staging sites if we need to for some sites that might need them. So, yeah. On the on the hosting side of things, Tiffany, is that, do you know, is there like a, a great deal of work that goes into preparing things <laughs> for that inevitable support burden that may or may not arise you know if there's a lot of activity we definitely do test ahead of time and see if there's anything sort of obvious but um our platform it's a managed platform so we roll out the updates fairly promptly um everyone doesn't get it at once i think but everyone gets it within 48 hours Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. unless they have been some for some reason like delayed updates like at at an account level okay Mm -hmm. sure okay and do they is there some kind of mechanism, Tiffany, for like if you roll it, start rolling that out, and then it appear suddenly realize that there are problems? Is there a mechanism for stopping that, or no? Do you know? I mean, so you'd have to like. I am still relatively new at Nexus and don't know all the ins and outs of like ah. the specifics of how those things roll out. That's a different team. 
Oh yeah. So I couldn't tell you. Jess might be able to tell you. She's in the chat. Um, ah. She's been there a lot longer than me. But. Thank you. I, I should actually mention the chat, shouldn't I? Because normally I do right at the beginning because I just do. And I forgot this time. So let's quickly show a few faces. Courtney Robertson is saying good day. She's got the coffee icon <laughs> put it to good use. Daniel um, Daniel Schultz-Smith, good morning from Chile, Florida. Chile, Florida? What? Is that? That's true, right? Or is that? It is, yeah. Oh, what? As in cold, cold there was, or just there like was an not airport really that, that hot. a new record low of forty-five degrees yeah. or something like that. Oh, oh, isn't it in Florida where I read something like like the iguanas die or something? No, they just <laughs> fall out of stunned. the They stun and fall out of the trees. So they're they not dying. Like they just no longer cling on, and then they just <gasps> fall out. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah. So, Last yes. Last year, there was a story going around about a guy who, like, panicked about the iguanas and was, like, trying to save them. And so, like, gathered up a bunch of them and put them in his car. But then they, you know, they warmed up. And then he had a bunch of, like, awake, <laughs> disoriented, <laughs> pissed off iguanas in his car with him. It's really you not a good idea. No, like, you like don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's brilliant. I love the way we digress on this show. It's absolutely wonderful. But, um, yes, it's chilly, says Jess. Um, what else have we got? Daniel says, did you see the iguana? Okay, so yes, oh, there we go. Um, this is obviously in reference to Michelle being a superhuman. <laughs> Jess, Jess is totally I'm not. Um, Peter Ingersoll, good morning from really cold Connecticut. Okay, he's got his credentials, I guess. Connecticut is significantly colder. Frozen iguanas, <laughs> like literally frozen. And Elliot, Elliot! Elliot lives just down the road from me, I think. <laughs> Elliot, you, uh, forgive me, Elliot. You're in Bridlington, is that right? Have I got that right? If that's the case, it's so nice to have somebody local on the show because I'm there's like a nobody local that I know, but that's brilliant. <laughs> Thank you so much. Okay, let's get back to it. Um, 5.9 Josephine. The headline features in, our, in this article are obviously full site editing. We've been expecting this for the longest period of time. I had a I had a play over many many months and then had a play with it during the other day. I've got to say, if you are coming from like a third party page builder or something like that, it may be that it doesn't meet all of the things that you would hope it to meet out of the gate. But it does do an awful lot more than you know any version of WordPress has ever done, and it kind of draws a line in the sand between not being able to do this stuff unless you are fairly technical and were willing to become some sort of theme developer. Uh, to having this inside of a UI. So full site editing um, is here. We've also got 2022, which I actually really like the look of. It's the new theme in WordPress. And if you've actually enabled it, you'll notice that it destroys the customizer. And what I mean by that is the customizer menus just go away because you've no need for that anymore. But just so that you know, if you don't wish to, that for that to happen, you can just carry on using you know your good old regular themes that you've been using forever and ever and the customizer will stay but if you if you do enable it you get the option now to go and modify all the things and i think it says something like editor um, with beta written next to it is is my impression. So that's also happened. We've also got uh, some typography settings. We've got the navigation block so that you can now create um, your primary menus and all the other different menus inside of the UI. You don't have to actually go to a separate menu section now. There's also, where was the other one that I really liked? Block patterns was quite nice, but this one I thought was really good as well. They've, they've made quite an, a lot of effort with the list view. I didn't remember that it was even called this, but if you've been inside of Gutenberg and you click the three little lines which are at the top, you get a list of all the blocks in order. And and I found it really troublesome to position things. You know, I've tried dragging a paragraph that I wish to go. And, you know, you can do that within the UI itself. But that apparently has been made to work a lot better as well. Um, and a better gallery block. So the gallery block has been updated. So they're the kind of headline features. It's easy for me to say that in about two minutes. But it really is a transformational release, this. I think we are on the cusp of a very different WordPress experience for a lot of people. So all that being said, I'm going to hand it over and ask for your impressions of 5.9 after just, well, just under a week playing. So anybody that wants to butt in, please do. Well, 
we're all so stunned. Mm. <laughs> I mean, I've been using the beta for a while. Mm. Like I've had it, I've had the beta enabled on my personal site for a while. And, um, you know, it, it takes a little bit getting used to, right? Because I've been using WordPress since like before there were plugins, right? So every new like generational change to WordPress, it's like that, that newbie feeling again, which I kind of dig, but maybe not everybody does. Um, and, but I, it's very cool. I've been able to do a lot, just kind of messing around with the Tove theme on my personal site Okay. and, um, you know, rearranging, you know, like where does the site title live and what's under it and like, what are, you know, the, the sort of global site look and feel like it's very exciting. Um, I know that, you know, in my previous role, we were doing a lot of like custom bespoke sites for people. And just this idea of, I mean, on one hand, it's kind of terrifying that like we can give them this and then like they can just go <laughs> mess it up. But that's, I think that's part of like the democratizing publishing, right? Is that like some people are just like, everyone can do whatever they want with their site, whether it's a good idea or not. Right. Um, and I think like, I think that's ultimately for the best, but I think that's going to be a real challenge for um, like freelancers, people who get paid to like make design decisions. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's actually it's for our enterprise clients, for example, they, they, they have a design, they have branding guidelines, they have to, so there are ways to lock these things down so sure, that people absolutely. don't really get all the bells and whistles in the same way but uh, you know you want to give be sure we're giving them cho as much choice as possible within some of those branding guidelines and um, i yeah. think if so you're somebody really cool. that's brand new to wordpress as with all of these things the new ui will just become your home and you'll be really mm -hmm. familiar with it within a few short weeks you know you'll know where to go i think the difficulty is going to be for us lot who are kind of used to going to the different parts of the website and we, we've compartmentalized okay that piece of functionality that always happens over here so i must remember and probably maybe you're the same as me if you when you've been building wordpress websites mm -hmm. you constantly have three or four tabs open of the exact same website because you've got the, the menus oh, yeah. in one tab, you've got the theme in another tab, you've maybe got some sort of, I don't know, you may be fiddling with the CSS and that's held somewhere else and that is opening in a yeah. further tab. And then you might actually have the page that you're working on open in a fourth tab. Um, but all of that's hopefully going to go away and it will all just be right there in front of you. I I played and tweeted out because I, I, I installed 5.9, when it came out and had another play. And I was, I, I thought it may be quite confusing the amount of things which come into the list view when you, for example, put um, a menu in or you put a headline block or what have you, because it seemed like quite a long laundry list of three or four different, five or six in some cases, different things that were put in. And, and there was a, there's a bit of an understanding of what you've got to do there because each, each thing is a separate block and that separate block is just achieving one thing, like it might be a paragraph. And, and it actually installs spaces as opposed to using padding. There was spaces used, which seemed quite, quite a curious thing to do. And so it's again, it just takes a little bit of getting used to, but I'm sure once people do get used to it, they'll they'll be fine. Um, Michelle, yeah, as always. You, oh, sorry. Oh, I was, gonna, no, no, I was no, gonna say my on. challenge is always I don't do a lot it, with content and client sites anymore. You know, my role is is doing other things. And so when I do get in to play, it's always who moved my cheese? How do I find this again? <laughs> right. And, uh, and I think that's true for a lot of folks who have long histories with WordPress, but I really feel like this is going to be open up so many doors for WordPress. So uh, it's, yeah. it's the a, first time I tried to use it. I was trying to rebuild my homepage into like a static homepage and you know how like the customizer disappears, right? And I was looking for that setting that determines like whether your homepage is like the, the blog posts or the or a static homepage. And I like for 20 minutes, just like <laughs> enraged, where's the customizer? <laughs> Why can't, well, they had taken that one setting, right? And they had moved it into the reading settings area, but I didn't know that. Um, right. and so yeah, for those of us who've been at it for a while, like I was like, like red face, like I have been working with this platform <laughs> for 16 years. Why can't I find this? <laughs> So I now we have ro road rage and we have 5.9 rage. <laughs> yes, I did have a little bit of, I had a little, little FSC rage, but you know, then I found it and I was like, okay, well, actually that makes the, sense. The thing, that the, the problem I suppose <laughs> is, um, is that that, that, will be going on a million times, won't it? And in order to improve things, things have got to be 
broken and taken to pieces we can't we can't Mm -hmm. well of Mm -hmm. course we can we could keep everything exactly as it is that would be possible but um something says that in 10 years time we'd regret that decision (laughs) you know um so things have have two things to two things to add so first i don't update my own sites i host with people like nexus and let them do it for me (laughs) which is always important right like I, I got out of that business for a real reason because I'm not running all of those sites anymore. And so, um, I mean, I am, but I'm not, and I don't want to be in the business of having to go through an update. So, you know, Nexus is one of my hosting companies and, um, yeah, I, I leave it to the lovely people over there to make sure that my sites work. The second is, and I put it in the chat. So if you wanted to look at it, you could later, uh, Nathan, I do a, a WordPress talk at WordCamps called how to empower your clients to use their sites, but client proof them at the same time. Nice. And the bottom line Great. is, I I made a little um, meme of uh, Bob Ross, you know, the happy little trees guy that says, it says there's, there are no accidents, just happy little, whatever he says. So I'm like, there are no accidents, just happy little opportunities to make more money from your clients because the more (laughs) that your client (laughs) has access to their own site, the more money you have an opportunity to make because, you know, you have contracted to do certain things and then when they break them that's outside of your contract usually if you're smart right and so now you're into an hourly rate and those hourly rates can really add up now that whether you have time to do them or not you know that's another story but every time there's a huge update in wordpress huge opportunity to make money if your clients have access to their own sites so just just make sure you have good backups for everybody yes always always it's a really god please I was going to say related, I mean, just related to that and also like to the back to the, to the update conversation, like in my previous role, we were looking after like 250 sites and we were a team of about 10 people. And rather than like, cause a lot of, of like small agencies and, and solo printers do this thing where they like, as part of their, um, you know, like kind of monthly maintenance fee or whatever they'll go through and they'll like update the plugins on a staging site and they'll check them and they'll like do it all. Well, we didn't have time for that. Right. Cause we were like, we had 250 sites and we had like 80 more in flight. Like we were just constantly like mm-hmm. hair on fire trying to turn out more work. So um, what we ended up doing was we just set everything to auto update. Everything. The second it came out, it updated, we set everything wow. and we hosted on pressable. Right. So Jetpack, WordPress core and WooCommerce were symlinked. Everybody got those updates at the same time. And we just figured that the chance of things breaking was from an update was smaller than the chance of things breaking because you didn't update. Hmm. And so we would just set everything to update and then fix it as it broke. I mean, you know, and it's really like, it's a cost benefit calculation. Like we Mm -hmm. found that like what we were fixing because like, and when things broke, was almost always because like Gutenberg changed something. Yeah. Oh, right. So and that happens, right? When because Gutenberg's like a beta plugin, but we were the special projects mm-hmm. team at Automatic. So like Gutenberg was a thing we were using. Um, you know, and that's so what I always tell people, like you can do it kind of both ways, right? Like you can do that that very deliberate. That's a good way to do it. If that's too much, like you could do it this other way. It just kind of depends on where your resources are. Mm-hmm. And what we had was development resources. What we didn't have was a lot of time for clicking the buttons. So if something broke and we couldn't yeah. fix it right away, we used the Jetpack rollback button mm-hmm. the, for the for the backups and just rolled it back and fixed it on staging and you know and rolled out a fix. And like that was, I don't necessarily suggest that for everybody, but it worked for us. Mm-hmm. My mm-hmm. my update process in WordPress is that I do everything with with a, a managed solution so in my case I'm using main WP which funnily enough we'll talk about in a minute but um, I go in every single day even when I'm on holiday actually because it's so trivially easy to do and I basically just scout scan through what's going to happen and then click update and I have uh, have a bunch of tools which are looking a, a, a variety of pages on all of those sites for mm-hmm. pixel level changes. So not that the, I mean, downtime is one thing. I mean, that would be slightly alarming, but you know, some great section of black has suddenly been introduced on the homepage or something like that. And it alerts me, but I still do it every single day. Now history would show that if I had taken your approach, Tiffany, I would have been absolutely fine because I've I've never had something come back and bite me. I've been updating these sites now for well over 10 years in some cases, 
and nothing has ever gone wrong. I mean, ever? touch. No, n- not once in that sense. I've been incredibly lucky, but I use a very narrow range of plugins. Um, mm-hmm. And I'm very confident in the people that are behind those. And when I see an update come through, I'm more or less certain that, that things are going to be fine. I say that I've had maintenance mode kind of balk on me. That's about as bad as it's got where the maintenance file just didn't delete itself for some reason. So the site goes down and I just need to delete that. But I haven't though, but I still continue to work on the basis that I should do it manually. So I do. Mm-hmm. And I've probably waste, wasted weeks <laughs> of my life doing, doing that if I had done what Tiffany has done. But caveat emptor, you know, don't blame me. <laughs> it goes yeah, wrong. I, I definitely don't recommend it if you don't have the resources to fix yeah. things that go wrong because we we have gotten bitten get, gotten bitten by that a few times um mm-hmm. we've had incidents where an update to very large and well-respected plugins like introduced a bug screwed up somebody's um yep. ticketing or something like that like it, it does happen from time to time yeah um yeah. and so you do need to be ready to to deal with whatever it is and so it really does depend on like your team composition but um, like, I think we've had kind of this received wisdom that like, there's only one right way to do this. And that is manually. And I think that's a good way to do it. There's just yeah. other good ways to do it, especially if you have, and this is so key, right? Really good, ideally real time backups. Yes. Yes. And beautiful that you've got the option in, in Jetpack to just kind of hit it and go, actually just go back. We'll figure it out later. That's really, really nice. Rob Cairns has said that he, uh, he thinks that the 5.9 upgrade path was very stable. Mm-hmm. It sounds like he's on a doing a similar service to you, but he's got 129 sites. So no, 127, he said, and he's gone through all of those and they've been absolutely mm-hmm. fine so far. Rob, curious, do you hit the button right away or do you wait like two or three days like many people seem to um, just to be a little bit more cautious? And then Courtney was saying... We're working on a lesson plan for Learn, with a capital L, about the static front page settings. Well, the menus would be settings, and then reading was available long before the customizer was created. Uh, but where is, an, where is it in a block theme training coming? Yeah, well, documentation that needs to probably... And that's learn dot, uh, learn.wordpress.org. Thank you. Think. Is, that, yeah. is that right, Michelle? Yeah, yeah yep, I believe so. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. Yep. I just said it with a capital L, which is, which wasn't very helpful at all, was it? Okay, but there we go. So lots and lots and lots and lots of interesting things happening. I'll just put this up because I thought it was curious, and I had almost sort of forgotten this part of the story. This is Sarah Gooding's paragraph on the WP Tavern when she went through and kind of talked about a very similar uh, set of things. She says, for many years, non-technical WordPress users were told to stay away from the theme editor menu and were warned that changes made there could make their sites inoperable. A new era in WordPress theme editing has dawned with the debut debut of the new template editor. It allows users to manipulate templates, home, single post, etc., and templates parts with a visual interface. It's quite a big change when you word it like that, the idea that you've been telling your clients forever, don't go there, don't touch that, just leave it alone because you can't. Now it's maybe get in there and have a fiddle. So we'll have to see how this goes. Okay. Mm -hmm. There is another piece I just wanted to mention. We probably won't go into it in great detail, but um, if you're into block-based themes, obviously that's the new thing in 5.9. There's 40 something, I think, in the repo at the moment. Uh, This piece by Marcus Kazmierkat, it's actually a little bit old. It's the 4th of January, so it's not current to this week, but I thought it'd be worth mentioning. If you are curious about what block-based themes can do, this is probably the the place to begin your journey. Uh, I'll quote, it says, if you aren't ready for a block theme yet, no worries. Classic themes continue to exist and work as always. Uh, Keep in mind, though, that to use the latest, greatest full site editing, you'll need a block theme, which is tailored to the newest features coming to WordPress. And he just explains what a block-based theme is and why it's different and what's going to be missing in the UI and so on and so forth. So I I thought that would be interesting. In reply, Rob Cairn says he did them all right away. You are brave, Rob. What, all 127? Just wallop. Wow. Okay. That's, uh, That's intriguing. We spoke about main WP just a minute ago. I thought this was lovely. It's a piece, um, Todd, Todd E. Jones, who's been on the show and uh, hopefully will come on again soon. He carried Happy out a birthday, survey. Todd. Oh, yes. Is that right? 
Today's totally his birthday. Is. 15 Face, again. Facebook told me. Yeah, okay. Uh, happy, happy birthday. Happy birthday, uh, Todd. That's lovely. But we're going to celebrate it without singing to you. We're going to just go through your little survey. He, he created a survey. I think he's done it a few years in a row now where he, he asked people, Main WP, we should probably emphasize, it's in their wheelhouse. They, kind of, they, ha- they offer a self-hosted uh, update service. So you can, you can have your own website, which basically links to all your other websites. And you can do things like backup, and you can do things like update plugins and themes and all of that kind of stuff. So that's what this is all about. And he carried out this web care survey. I suspect that if you are into building WordPress websites, you're going to be interested in uh, trying to generate as much revenue out of that, that business as possible. And over the last period, decade or so, web care plans have become like a real linchpin of most people's businesses, I would have thought. You know, long gone are the days where you build the website and then give it to your client and say, bye, you okay. now want to build those relationships. And so that's what this survey is all about. Todd goes through what it is that people are offering and and what their businesses are. And there's some curious stuff that came out of it, and I, I wondered what you guys think about it charging in terms of money most people charge for their care plans 60 percent almost monthly yearly is 17 well nearly 18 percent and quarterly is just down at seven percent i always did it monthly that just made the most sense to me because it's easy for them to buy into that because they get that kind of they can cancel at any time feeling but bet what are you doing uh, we have historically done uh, annually, hmm. but I'm shifting a little bit, partly as we're bumping pricing up some, it makes it a little more palatable to to folks to not have as big an outlay. Um, but, um, and and I also just in the last year, ha- ha- actually in preparation for being here out, out of, away from home, I stopped taking paper checks huh. last year. Just and that's of the been, fees. and that uh, no because of the mail service hmm. getting the mail to you when well the mail service was having problems but then also if you're trying to move you know locate yourself around it's harder to get the mail forwarded reliably and so we've been switching to that and I'm thinking that actually putting them on cards now is just sort of like that step into um, switching everybody to monthly eventually so. we um. We have a service in the UK, and I'm sure it's replicated elsewhere. It's called um, it's called Go Cardless, and it's a uh, it uses the banking system, so it doesn't go through Stripe or PayPal. It kind of, but it, it's essentially it's the same thing. But the fees are so small. Yes. Um, I've been using that for many years, and anything which is recurring on a on a monthly or annual basis you set up what's called a direct debit. So rather than having an agreement with Stripe, you have an agreement with directly with that customer and they sign something which authorizes you to basically take money out of their bank account on a regular basis um, and gives you the flexibility to change that amount as well. You could up it uh, with their authorization, which is quite nice. Mm-hmm. But the you see pricing for WordPress plugins is very, very often uh, done as monthly, sort of pro rata, if you know what I mean, not monthly, but they say what it would cost you monthly if you pay for the whole year. Do you know what yes. I mean? They sort of pretend that it's a, a monthly fee, but it never quite is. Anyway, I just thought that was interesting. 60, 60% of people doing it that way. This is interesting. How much money do you get in return for what you offer? And I, it looks like the the low end of the market is winning. You know, anything between twenty five and a hundred dollars is sixty two percent. A hundred to two hundred is twenty eight percent. Two hundred plus is eleven percent. It, I, I've, I found it very hard to get the the higher fees for this. I think it's a service which is you'd have to be a very good salesperson. Well, it depends on what your what the client, who the client is, right, and then what you're providing. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so, so for instance, we, you know, we've just been talking about updates and we do have some clients who have what they consider to be mission critical websites where they never want um, things, uh, updates done unless it's been done on a staging site first. So fine, you're going to pay more than $200 a month for that. Do you, do you have that all figured out? Like, is there a plan that you have ready to go that has those components in it? Or do you have to make them up on a bespoke a basis well we have kind of some ballparks i mean I, we have clients in all three of these ranges um 
And, uh, you know, some of it has just been um, having an idea about what we're providing this client, but then we're there adding a few more things and we're just subtracting. So I'm doing it. Yeah. A little bit of, of it is bespoke. Okay. Uh, this is to your point then, but I guess it depends on what you offer. Seems that the, the obviously, you know, there's the probably uptime and all of that kind of stuff. But the biggest thing by far in, as an ancillary service is SEO. 57% of the people survey. I should say this survey it was about 131, I think, people participated. So it's a fairly decent set of data. 57% uh, of people offered SEO. Uh, content creation, 47%. Paper click, I thought that'd be higher. That's only at 26%. Email marketing, that was something I always enjoyed offering. Mm -hmm. um, that was kind of something that I actually liked doing. Um, but the SEO side of things, I never really wanted to touch because it always seemed like the goalposts were going to move. I'd figure everything out. And then two weeks later, I'd be told by Google, that actually, that's a load of rubbish. Hosting, 1.5%. That's curious. Um Anyway, there we go. Um, what the, well, the one thing that I don't see on that list that maybe Todd has put into content creation is content management. We mm. end up doing that a lot for clients. They'll provide content, a blog post or something that they, they just don't want to get in the back end and they want us to put this content they have created into the website. How do you do that? Do you have like a Google Doc shared or do they get into WordPress and create a draft or do, you just, do they just tell you we need a piece about this? Um, we use a uh, an email-based ticketing system, so we're using okay. Freshdesk, and they'll just send it. Sometimes they send it as a doc or a PDF file, or sometimes it's just right in the email itself. So nice. Uh, let's just do a couple more other services: website development and design, ninety percent, as you might expect. Private. Oh yeah, this was interesting. Privacy policies came out as like number number two, I think. Yeah, privacy policies along with digital marketing campaigns. <laughs> was 34% of people. Yeah. I just thought that was absolutely fascinating. Privacy policies. It's all the rage. Ter Termageddon. Yeah. Right? So mm -hmm. they, they do some really great things for uh, providing resources for people to resell Termageddon. And you can, you can get a good, good kickback in terms of, uh, you know, you can purchase multiple policies at a discount and then sell them onto the clients. And they provide some great resources for educating clients about privacy policies. Yeah. I wonder, mm -hmm. actually, I wonder if mo uh, the majority of that is done through services like term again, because you are getting into fairly complicated, potentially legal things, but I know that mm -hmm. the guys at term again, is it Hans? Hans Skillrod, isn't it? Uh, um, Hans and Donata. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. they, they will take care of you if you're in North America, Canada, Europe, and Australia, and I think various other jurisdictions. But yeah, Termageddon. Yep. And I, Hans them. has mentioned it now in public more than once, I think. So uh, they're coming out with a cookie consent policy that will be rolled into their dashboard nice. soon. So, yeah, yeah, that's awesome. That is nice. Uh, and then the rest of it, you can explore at your leisure. I think I think we've gone mm -hmm. through the, the sort of highlights of that. But I just thought that was kind of curious. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Okie dokie. What have we got now? <laughs> oh, yay. Okay, so we're all talking about 5.9, 5.9. It's old news now, 5.9. It's old hat. <laughs> this is genuinely interesting to me, though. This is Justin Tadlock um, talking about Six, WordPress six, okay, mm -hmm. it's like it's got to happen. Um, <laughs> and I don't know why. Why don't we go to five point ten? Did we ever do that? We've done that. Have we gone to like a four point mm. ten ever, or has it always gone from nope. nine to no? Is it always it's always release it's on? always yeah no okay. Um, okay, so Justin Tadlock's piece is called "Looking Ahead to WordPress Six: The Early Roadmap." I'm going to quote a few things here. There is some cool stuff coming in the WordPress space. Version six is expected to be a conceptual wrap of phase two of the Gutenberg project. What he means by that is Gutenberg came in four phases, finished number one, which was the just the plain, simple editing experience, which Gutenberg is. Then customization, which we're kind of knee deep in at the moment. So that's things like full site editing, block patterns, block directory, block themes, and global styles. 
There's a lot of work still to be done. We'll look at that in just a moment. And then phase three after that is collaboration. So think Google Docs inside a WordPress. That's I've probably just totally oversold it there. But the idea is you won't get that. Somebody's locked this post. You can't go anywhere near it unless you yank it out of their control. The idea with you'd be able to go in and asynchronously edit things, which... Oh, please, that would be so... Just the show notes for this show would be so much nicer if I could do some sort of asynchronous post. That'd be great. Um, and then finally, multilingual, but that's obviously going to be a little while away. This is so nice. I apologize for people who are not watching this. If you're listening to this, this is going to be difficult to explain. But in the next release of WordPress, it is hoped that we'll have theme global style variations. And imagine... Uh, a website where you've finessed absolutely everything and you've got it exactly what, how you would like. Um, but you'd be able to just swap out all the colors for all the things but with the click of a button. So I don't know, all the headings will change to something else. And I can just imagine if you were an agency and you had this all wrapped up, you could easily sell. You can have the red version or the blue version. Or how about this nice creamy version? So that's going to be nice. Go and have a look on the post. You'll get a better idea. Um, navigation structures as a dedicated UI. Template creation and theme switching. That'll all be easier. Patterns I'm really as a excited about the theme switching. Sorry, say, go on. You interrupt me. Go on, go for it. I'm excited about the theme switching. I feel like it has been entirely too long where you would switch themes on a WordPress site, your homepage would completely fall apart and you'd have to redo it. Yeah. Like the idea that you'd be able to like switch themes and actually retain at least some of what you've already done. Yes. As opposed to I mean, just I, a, you know, yeah, a complete mess. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. a really I'm just, good Cause point. I'm just thinking about these like people who have like, you know, like one or two person sites that just don't have like a whole big, like they're not enterprise clients who have like a style guide and, and things like that. They're people who want to change up the look of their site periodically. Like they, the idea of like you swap a theme and then suddenly you've got to completely rebuild your homepage is like, that's been a major deterrent for people. And it's a huge source of like support requests as well. It's like I switched themes and like suddenly everything broke. Um, so I'm really, I'm excited about this. I'm annoyed that it has taken until version 6.0 to get to this. That it, that will be a really nice moment, won't it? Where it, broadly speaking, you'll be able to flick through a whole variety of different block-based themes. And in the, in the most part, it will look the same because everything's contained within the block as opposed to the theme, you know, the styling for the, the headings and what have you. That's all taken care of in the block. And so there's nothing going to be overridden. Yeah, good point. I've kind of forgotten how that was. I've, I've been using the same theme for so long that it kind of doesn't, doesn't really affect me too much. Uh, block patterns as a first class creation tool. I, Justin is, you, I'm going to quote him because he obviously likes this. Since their introduction alongside WordPress 5.5, patterns have been one of the most powerful tools available to users. I've been tell, telling anyone who will listen that they will be a game changer for at least two years. WordPress 6.0 might deliver on that promise. I, um, I use patterns a bit for like the newsletters and things like that but i haven't really made a great deal of use of them in in all honesty but the idea of having pre-configured bits of websites that you can just throw up i think will be great i love the idea of installing a theme and then just being presented with a whole laundry list of what about this wouldn't this be a nice way to make your website look let's chuck this row in or this pattern in seems like a good idea let's throw away a newsletter subscription in at the end of in the middle of the blog post, instead of you know building it into the theme to always show up at the end, that's like what right. if you could determine where that is because you've yeah. got a pattern for it? Yeah, like there's yeah. a lot. It is going to be a game game changer. He is correct. <laughs> he's uh, he's usually correct. <laughs> it's, it's, what, it's, what, it's what I found. If he's listening to this, let's hope he uh, he takes that in the spirit. This is nice. Featured images with superpowers. Um, yes. he, he sort of goes on to say there's probably not as much in this as he thinks, but I do like the idea of featured images having superpowers. Mm -hmm. At the moment, apparently, this will only take the the small post thumbnail um, for backgrounds and things like that. Inline tokens, this will be a huge thing. I actually tried to do this the other day. I was trying to put in exactly what he said, actually, which is curious. The I was trying to grab the URL. No, I was trying to grab like the date or something and put it in as a dynamic field. 
And there was a whole load of things that I couldn't do. Basically, at the moment, if you want to put in custom data, you, you are really limited in what you can do. There's a little icon which appears. It looks like three sort of concentric circles, three uh, stacked circles, you know, like an old database kind of thing. And um, and that's going to be improved massively, which is quite nice. That'll be really useful. Like again, and... getting all the way to 6.0 before they put in the ability to put in your copyright date in the footer without either writing it in PHP in your theme or like registering a whole widget area so that you can edit it every January 1st is like, yeah. like why did yeah. it take us so long? <laughs> yeah, it's going to take bet literally two two days just to go through the 130 websites, changing the one to a two. <laughs> Yeah, there has to be a better way. Uh, a few more blocks coming out in the near future as well. So, for example, he mentions here this table of contents block, which, you know, that's a very good use case. I won't be making mm -hmm. use of that one, but I can certainly see a lot of people will. But boatloads of interesting stuff coming in 6.0. Mm -hmm. So anybody want to add anything into that before I move on? No, I'm really excited first. to see some of these things. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I didn't catch that comment. What, what was that? I said, just make sure you do your backups first. That's right. Yeah. Or as or you can be Rob Cairns and just go for it. Just click that button and go for it. Okie dokie. Okie dokie. Um, a bit of a shout wrong. out. We have um, we had the guys from Groundhog. There he is. Look at that. Adrian. Adrian Toby was on a few weeks ago um, mm -hmm. on this particular show. And Adrian is in a company called Groundhog. And, you know, whenever you hear the word Groundhog, I bet more or less everybody follows that up in their head with the word day because of the film. Mm -hmm. I certainly did when I first heard that there was a WordPress plugin called Groundhog. They've got a lovely little day coming up. And, in fact, it's in, mm -hmm. like, two or three days' time. Is it Wednesday? Was that week. On, ground, on the actual Groundhog, on Groundhog day. day. There is a Groundhog Day. Yes. Oh, yeah. That's Did you think it was just a movie? No, I just thought they'd made it up for the movie. What What? What do they no, do really on ground? Thing. I mean, I know that obviously now it's been totally usurped to be like the idea that everything just repeats itself. What What on earth is ground? So on of? February 2, the, the, you know, the legend the is the groundhog comes up. If he sees his shadow, there will be six more weeks of winter. If he doesn't see his shadow, spring will come early. I have to ask. So some dudes in a top hat like pull this poor rodent out of his like temporary burrow because the rest of the year he lives in like the public library, right? <laughs> he has a name. His name is Punxsutawney Phil. His name is Phil. Punks yep. So, okay, so it's a particular groundhog. <laughs> it's a particular groundhog. But what in happens if that groundhog... Pennsylvania, which is yes. like a little town? Yeah. What if? Forgive me. What if the groundhog passes away? <laughs> they get a new one. Oh, it's I see. Like when, so. when your goldfish like a, died as a kid, it's like a two hundred like, year old like, groundhog. Exactly. Like they just get another fill. The other ones, the other a... ones have gone off to live on the farm. That's <laughs> such a cool tradition. <laughs> not of the original fill. Like this has okay. been going on for years and years and years. Okay, I'm totally going off topic here, but I've got to, I've got to drill into this because I love this stuff. So the groundhog <laughs> is a particular groundhog, and it, it is pulled more or less from a hole. And okay, so who decides whether it's seen its shadow or not? Oh, the guys in the no, top hats. And there's yeah, so but, much media. It's a huge media event every year. But how did the news but, news station? Like it's a bit like me it. talking to my cat and saying, "I don't know, did you enjoy that biscuit?" You know, and they're like <laughs> expecting a response. How did it they? It really has to do with how sunny the day is. Oh, so if okay. the day is sunny, then he would see a shadow, and it would scare him back into his burrow, and therefore six more weeks of winter. This is genius. I have to yeah. learn more. Sadly, the event that we're talking about features no actual groundhogs being pulled out of holes by men with top hats. You could not make that up. Honestly, if you... It, <laughs> Men in top hats pulling a creature out of the ground and determining so that's brilliant. Um, but this one will also be brilliant. He's got this day, uh, Wednesday, the actual Groundhog Day. I think he's going to be doing it every year or every day. Mm -hmm. um, and it's for agencies. And really, I just want to show you the little list uh, of who's coming on. So it's Leslie Sim behind uh, Newsletter Glue. She's going to be talking mm -hmm. about launching, marketing, and scaling a new product, which obviously she has done in the last year or so with um, Newsletter Glue, and she did it very well in the open. Um, Jack Arturo, who has WP Fusion, he's going to be showing you how that all works. 
Paul Toby, I think is, I think it might even be Adrian's father, leveraging YouTube growth uh, as a growth channel. Then is Adrian himself. He's got something about him the CRM that they offer, which is Groundhog. Chris Britton, 10 tips in 10 minutes to grow and share pipeline. Um, and then I'll just scroll through plugins, integrate your pl WordPress plugin stack to save to save time and money. Vito Peleg, who's a regular on this show, he's talking about Atarim and how to get clients to, uh, well, to deliver things without the fuss. Chris Budget, who's obviously with Lifter LMS, um, talking about scaling up revenue in any business with courses and memberships. Michael Short, grow your agency by outsourcing content creation. The fabulous Robert Jacoby, 10 questions to ask your host before you commit. Bridget, is your agency taking advantage of client SEO budget? I'm hoping Bridget will come on the show at some point. And Mark, who was on just a couple of weeks ago from WS Form creating user-friendly and high-converting forms. And then the day rounds off with Colin Longworth, uh, Robbie Adair, and more Adrian. There he is. So there we go. I did not know that Groundhog was a real thing. Groundhog Day was a real thing. And uh, mm -hmm. I have. we have so many weird traditions like that in the UK. We have the, uh, the annual, I should put it up on YouTube, but I'll probably get in trouble. We have the annual cheese rolling ceremony, which is brutal. Oh, yes. They get a big cheese, a big... <laughs> A wheel, what the wheel heck? Of cheese. a massive wheel, of, wheel cheese. of cheese, and they take it to this muddy hill, which is basically it's about forty-five degrees, and they roll the cheese, and the cheese because it's really heavy accelerates unbelievably quickly, and the idea is that a bunch of people throw themselves toward the cheese and try to catch it before it gets to the bottom. Just Google it, and it's it. You just looking at people like getting broken legs and bashing them. It's just like, why would you do that? What? You never did it as a young person, huh? No, yeah. no, but it is quite a, it's quite a popular thing. We've got lots of things like that. Rob Kearns in the uh, chat says that in Canada, they have Wharton Wiley. What is Wharton Wiley? <laughs> I don't know. It's their groundhog. Okay. Maybe it's a groundhog thing. Is it a groundhog thing? T yeah. Tell us more, Rob. It's, I want to know what Wharton Wiley I is. I think Wharton Wiley is their version of Punxsutawney Phil. There you go. Look, you see, I'm sticking with Elliot. Elliot, good, good for you. He's a, you know, like I said, he lives near me. He's never heard of Groundhog Day before, either, apart from the film. Uh, and then, oh, where's he gone? Daniel says we're weird, us Americans. I'm not saying it. Okay, so it is your Groundhog, yeah. But why Wharton Wiley? What's that got to do with? <laughs> Is Wharton the town? Phil, I mean, because like Punxsutawney oh. Phil is named after the town. We like technically, invent... his name is Phil, and he lives in Punxsutawney. I got it. Okay, we, we should. The four of us should invent a weird WordPress tradition and like Ooh. carry it out. Keep your thinking yeah. caps on. See what we can do. <laughs> that involves up cheese. Have a hole in the ground and sees its shadow yeah. and how That's long right. will it be until <laughs> the next major release? <laughs> I think we should have. I think we should put a groundhog in a wheel of cheese. And mm. no, I'm not. I'm going to get no. done by the animal rights people. Uh, okay, Michelle, let's put this one up. Um, I'm going to do your two bits, if that's all right. I'll come back to your bit in a minute. Yeah, this, yeah. this is uh, this is a piece which came out on the 20th of January. It's called "Can Five for the Future Fund WordPress Research?" I feel like this is the news story which is going to break in 2022. It feels like the "How is WordPress funded?" discussion is going to get more and more interesting, you know, because it seems that quite a few people are putting their heads above the parapet at the minute and saying um, saying things which I've not really heard before and questioning how the how the governance of WordPress works, how the, the, the people who volunteer perhaps need to be remunerated. Maybe that's not financial, but they need to be sort of remunerated in some way. And um, Five for the Future is obviously some way of doing this. The idea being that you, your company, whatever it might be, uh, give a, give five percent of your time, let's say, um, and contribute that towards the project. And so, obviously, if you've got a big agency, that could be a considerable amount of uh, finance or people's mm -hmm. time. And some companies do this; other companies stay well away from it, and they just, for want of a better word, they just take. And they don't necessarily give. 
And and this piece is exploring all of that. They're trying to figure out what that model looks like going forwards. I feel that in the in the beginning when open source software started, the kind of volunteer mentality was totally sustainable forever, more or less. But I'm just curious mm-hmm. now that we've got these great big, almost enterprise level open source software projects like, well, WordPress is the perfect example. How is that sustainable based upon volunteers' time? I mean, I know that there's a plenty of seconded time from other companies, uh, Automatic, Yoast come to mind. But um, this is just a piece really tackling that question. Um, mm-hmm. How are we going to, how are we going to, figure it out what even are the questions that we need to be asking you know how do we onboard new members it says what should we be what should we we be worried about how can we keep new members and help them to grow and then it goes on to uh well that'll that's probably summing it up nicely i don't have the answer to this i kind of wish that everybody got paid fabulously large amounts of money for every single minute that they put into the project but i guess it just doesn't work that way any thoughts Yeah, one of the things that um, Allie and I have talked about on the Underrepresented in Tech podcast is that the more underrepresented you are, the harder it is to give your time because you're uh, you're most likely being paid less and earning less than other people. And, you know, if you have a family and you have all these things that other people have, donating your time to be able to participate in something like Mm -hmm. uh, the development of WordPress becomes a, a, a larger tax than it is for somebody who's in a more privileged situation. So I think that's definitely one, uh, one of the um, one of the things we struggle with. The other thing, and I did bring this up at State of the Word as well, is that we tend to be seeing WordPress age as we go, and we're not bringing as many younger folks into the fold. Uh, we mentioned this when I when Anne um, was on the show with us about a month ago, mm-hmm. uh, Anne McCarthy, about how there it's a different it's a different marketing to today's 20 and, and, you know, younger thirties than it is to people like me in my fifties. Right. So that, you know, to me, it's like you own your own site, you know, you have complete autonomy. Um, and then, but Anne said, but that it's more like a, it's and everybody contributes and this is something that's owned by everybody. And so like, there's a different, um, you know, it's a different marketing ploy that you have to bring into account. And then you pair that with the fact that the entire marketing team is also volunteers and that wheel moves very slowly because it's all just like contributing ideas and doing a lot of writing, but very few people at the top of that that are actually doing the tweeting and putting things on a blog and those kinds of things. So I don't know what the overhaul for that looks like. I mean, we did try having a paid head of the marketing um, with Yost, of, you know, uh, about two years ago, maybe that was, uh, and that was that didn't work out at that particular time. That's not to say that it wouldn't work with somebody different whose only job it was to participate in and kind of head up that department. I don't know what the right answer is to be able to move all things forward all the time, but it's clear that we need to do something. And I think, I mean, I have an MBA marketing, so, you know, my every, whatever, wherever your, your silo is like, that's the answer, right? Like my solution is we have to do better marketing to get people in. But then on the other hand, we need to make sure that somehow it's accessible for people to do that, whether it's monetary time, whatever it is. It, when I was um, freelancing, it was a lot more difficult to give up my time to all the projects that I do because I was struggling for every dollar I made developing sites and doing my care plans and all those other things, as opposed to now that I have a steady income through Stellar, I can do those other side projects that I want because I have the time to do that because the income that I have is, you know, between nine and five, so to speak. So there's just, there's a whole lot at play more than I think we tend to think about when we look at these things, because we're not also looking at um, geographic locations and socioeconomic um, divides. Do you think that WordPress is a, is an interesting subject for like 18 year old budding developers or, you know, they're coming out of university. I kind of get the feeling that if we rewind the clocks 15 or 16 years, because CMSs just didn't exist really, you were kind of, you were groundbreaking. You were doing something and there was probably a lot of novelty in it and you were building the future of what, what, what is the internet? What even is that going to look like? Well, okay, let's get involved with building something which is going to help people for the first time in the history of the universe to create their own content 
from their own, you know, bedroom and publish it to the entire world. You know, it's exciting. It's really interesting. And now, fast forward to now, it's it's been done. That's been achieved. And we, we're sort of finessing it a bit, aren't we? And we're worrying about whether we've got a block for this and a block for that. And But the, the project broadly exists. Or you could go and, you know, work for Squarespace and maybe earn a decent salary. I'm I, I just fascinated to know what, what, I don't know what younger people would make of a software project like like WordPress. I mean, I think there's I, still I that kind of like <laughs> sitting in, you know, there's still that like tinkering and like teaching yourself to do stuff. But like when I was teaching myself to do this, like the state of the web was like blogger was a big deal. Yeah. And then movable type and then WordPress right? Like I was hand coding my first website on GeoCities back when like the URLs still like were supposed to correspond to like an address, right? Like, so that's, that's how old I am, but um, pour one out for GeoCities. But, you know, now like what, like what if you're sitting at home and you're like learning to code something and you're learning, like you're like hacking together, it's going to be like a mobile app. It's not going to be a website. And so I think like the energy around WordPress has moved kind of out of this like I'm gonna build myself a blog and move more into like business right and how do we make money and and like and how do we like advance a brand on the internet versus something that like you might do for fun might be more of like a mobile app and I think that's in some ways kind of an inevitable shift but then WordPress has to figure out how they're going to get new interest in the project. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, and I think that whole piece of how do we onboard volunteers and how do we help people come into an existing pro it's always easier to get people in on something new and like that's just getting started, right? Because then everybody is on the same level playing field and it's a lot harder to bring volunteers into an existing project right. where there are already people who have long histories, some, in some cases, really long histories of leadership and particular ways of doing things. And it's really hard to feel like you can make a difference when you're there um, sometimes. I, so, you know, how we can do that in some ways that will draw people in and make them interested in participating is, mm -hmm. is a challenge. Okay. I, I obviously all four of us are just really into publishing and WordPress and, and I imagine we've got a great relationship with the community and we like it and we've seen the benefits of all of that. I do I do wonder if if I were uh, like the 21 year old version of myself again, if the draw to things like IOT or you know making like uh, Tiffany said a mobile app or just getting involved in some sort of SaaS company, might be might be more desirable and also just like basic things like the cost of living it feels like the cost of living now is is hard is higher than it was 15 or so years ago and just making money might be more important um but i guess it seems like a great endeavor if we can persuade i don't know 30 40 20 percent of the wordpress pe of, of people who benefit from wordpress to give 5% in some way, shape or form, whether that's to the documentation or to the code or events or whatever it might be, the project would be in a, in, a, in much better shape. But that conversation needs to be opened up and that's what this piece is about. But come 2022, I feel that there's, I feel that a lot more people are going to start putting their heads up above the parapet and saying, look, I can't do this unless I'm paid for it? Is there a mechanism to be paid for it? Because I, I just can't put in the time that it's needed. So there was a, an interesting thing that came up, uh, I think it was last week I saw someone had tweeted out that um, a particular developer, I don't know to say his name, but um, that GitHub offers opportunities now for sponsoring developers. Hmm. And so uh, Joel Dolson from the WordPress accessibility team talked about, you know, I'm a freelancer, I've got to earn a living, and I do these things for the community, would you be interested in sponsoring me? And so people could make one-time gifts, people could make recurring gifts, and he his goal was, I, don't know, I think, f three or four, five hundred dollars a month or something, you know, he had a, little, a small goal that was a part of that that would help fund his continued work, and, you know, it, that may be an interesting uh, way that we can democratize even sort of 
five for the future, right? So we can yeah. we can sponsor some things that we have interests in. Uh, you know, I have a, Joe does some amazing things for the accessibility team, and and if that helps free up his anxiety and burnout around earning a living too, then maybe there's some ways that um, other people can we can sponsor people to do things. I thought yeah. that was interesting. Yeah, really interesting. And also just the sort of discoverability of that. So as an example, it may be that, like Bet, you are, if you're really into accessibility, you'd be keen to put your hand in your pocket for somebody who was working on that particular initiative. But I guess if, I guess just discovering who these people are, and for, forgive me for saying this, because this is, it's the most blunt thing I can say, and, it, and it's it's not what I'm intending to say, but some sort of ranking of people's contribution um so it may be for example that somebody is is incredibly committed but very quiet about it mm -hmm. and in some way raising their profile and saying look actually we all know the gigantic amount that you do and and we also know that you're humble and don't wish to mention it but look we would in some way le like to raise you on a pedestal and mm -hmm. one of those one of the benefits of that is that you may get some um reward for that financial well, reward or otherwise. I don't know. I mean, you know, there's a lot of slippery slope in there. Yeah, that I think you're, exactly. Be careful about. And yeah. I think, you know, again, the people, some not in this conversation, but in other places, people have meant, you know, contributing to WordPress is not just putting in co writing code or putting code in, right? Contributing to WordPress is the marketing team and the support team and the, you know, uh, all, all the community, all the things that people are doing for communities all over. Um, you know, so mm -hmm. our agency do, tries to do a little bit we don't I know it's probably not five but you know we do a little bit of contribute by by compensating our staff at, uh, for some of the work that they do primarily what they do currently is um, meetups sponsoring yeah. meetups yeah. and giving talks yeah. right and so we, we want to make sure that people feel like they can do that and not have it impact their income or their time so yeah, really interesting conversation. Anyway, it's been opened up, and I'm sure it will continue to be talked about in 2022. You can find it over at poststatus.com, and you want to be looking for the article, Can Five for the Future Fund WordPress Research? So worth worth looking at. Okay, let me put the screen back up. There it is. You can see it now. And okay, I just wanted a little mention for this one. This is just slightly over a week old, but uh, Angela Jin. Um, who hopefully we'll have on the podcast at some point, thanks to Michelle's introduction, is um, she She mentions that she would like people to get their work into the new photo directory. I'll quote, as announced in State of the Word 2021, WordPress now has a photo directory. You, uh, the photo directory is both curate, a curated source of high quality images and a new submission tool for Openverse, which is uh, we've mentioned before powered by the WordPress community. It's not fully launched yet. However, there are three ways you can help, and I'll mention the first two. Please contribute your photos. Uh, there's a link in this article where it says you can submit those photos. And the second way is to report issues. But yeah, fabulous endeavor. This is what it looks like currently with some 776 photos as of this moment that you can download and use. And uh, I, my understanding, I didn't know it when we hit record, well, just before that, you've put a few on here, haven't you, Michelle? Yeah, they um, they approached me because they know that I'm an avid photographer and asked me if I would kind of prime the pump. And so I put about 200 photos out for them to use. I think they've got about 60 or 70 of my photos in there already. But they're, you have to scroll back very far because they're in there chronologically. And I was one of the earlier people to oh. submit. But if you, I think if you do photos slash photos slash Michelle Ames, because that's my name in the repository, I think that you come up with my photos. And um, while he's doing that, Michelle, can you say something about how the usage license no I thing in Ames. Mm -hmm. no. <laughs> Yeah, so it has to be, they have to be photos that you can, that, were, that you took in a place. It might just be photos slash, I'm sorry, I keep screwing it up. But I'll tell you what, um, if, you, if you find it I'll after find you've spoken, yeah. I'll, I'll put it up, yeah. I will, yep. The, uh, but they have to be photos that you've taken and you have full rights to share um, in places that are legal to take those photos, et cetera, so that it, because they will become open source, right? So they become, I can't remember the name of C3 or something like that, but um, they will become open source. You are sharing them for others to be able to use on their sites free of copyright um, and all of that. So 
I think CC0. I could be That's wrong on that. That's what it is. That. I just yeah. don't remember. And um, this is quite an exciting project if it links to Openverse because Openverse is, is such a such a great initiative. And the idea would be that it wouldn't ultimately be limited to just photos. We mentioned before that the team have their eye on um, a directory which could encompass other things like, you know, obvious media, video, and perhaps PDFs and things like that. But also, and fantastically interestingly, what about block patterns? If you could have block patterns mm. as part of Openverse and you could freely give away your designs for the community to use and then they could be searched for within the WordPress dashboard. In in a future version of WordPress, there will be hopefully a little button. And when you upload to the media library, you will be able to opt your images in. So if you've taken a photo, you obviously can't use somebody else's photo in that way. But if you've taken your own photo and are putting that on your own WordPress website, the idea is that that would go in. Okay, I've got it there, Michelle. I will. Let's have a little look. Here we are. There is a roaring lion. Wow. Whoa, Where did you yeah. take that photo? At the zoo. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, you had a you really interesting safari. day. Just <laughs> no, off, was just off camera safari. was a groundhog. Uh, <laughs> oh, these are lovely. They're lovely. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. That, this, yeah. Okay. So go and upload your photos to the, the photo oh, directory. Nice. The article... Uh, over at make.wordpress.org was, as I said, by Angela Jin. It's called WordPress Photo Directory. Call for volunteers. Okay. Here's something to get you annoyed. Google, nothing to do with WordPress, this. Google have uh, got... <laughs> oh, please, Google. Google had this idea of called Flock, and they were obviously getting a lot of flack. I should <laughs> just coined that. I should have thought of that earlier. They got a lot of flack for... Um, for it, basically, that they the idea would be that it would kind of replace cookies. So instead of being able to track you everywhere on the planet, you would be pushed it into this cohort. F L O C stands for Federated Federated Learning of Cohorts, and you would somehow get aggregated. The this, as you can imagine, met with almost universal ire. Um, projects like WordPress and Drupal and a whole bunch of other folk decided no this is ridiculous we don't want any we don't want anything to do with that and and so google have decided to get rid of it however google would love to be able to know who you are and where you go on the internet so they've come up with this other interesting idea called topics <clears throat> and topics put something in a browser so chrome itself Will now, okay, so I shouldn't be so hard on Google. It's not like the end of the world or anything, but it's going to be in the browser instead, and it's going to categorize you in a very what feels like a very similar way, um, and you will it will all be stored on a device. So you your device itself, your Chrome browser, will store that information, so it's not going off to to Google servers. But it it does feel to me a bit of a stretch for people to say, yeah, I'm going to install a browser that's got technology in it, which is enabling Google to, to track me. I don't know. What do you guys think? Well, yes, it's, it's, <laughs> it kind of feels like it's very much the same sort of thing. Um, and privacy is just becoming a huge, much bigger, bigger deal for us. Right. If you are, and, and uh, I had a conversation with uh, some folks Last week, I was part of a webinar. Uh, I, I wasn't a presenter, but I was part listening in on this webinar that the Termageddon folks did around the new EU uh, in Austria. There was apparently yeah. a court case related to all of this about tracking cookies that basically says you can't use Google Analytics uh, in Austria for now. And they expect the rest of the EU to kind of follow suit and uh, and reminded again and again, you know, if you're uh, if you're not paying for the tracking service, you are the product. Right, your your data is just there, and the massive amounts of data that just get tracked and sold. And the thing crazy. is, yeah, everybody uses Chrome, don't they? I guess it's just the default, and nobody's. I, I, and I suppose a lot of us who obsess about the internet, like I do, 
they worry about this kind of thing. Maybe it's just not a big deal, but I'll read from what Google said. They said, with topics, your browser determines a handful of topics like fitness, travel, that represents your top interests for that week based, based upon your browsing history. Topics are kept for only three weeks and old topics are deleted. Topics are selected entirely on your device without involving any external servers, including Google servers. When you visit a participating site, topics picks just three Three topics, one topic for each of the past three weeks to share with the site and its advertising partners. It just feels to me like if Google did manage to pull this off, they would become the only horse in town. Is that even a phrase? They'd become the only groundhog in town. Um, and all the advertisers would be, you know, it, you'd have to use Chrome. Everybody would be pushing Chrome as the thing. I don't think Vendors like Firefox and Brave are going to have a bar of this, so it's really interesting. We've decided to shove it all in a in a browser. Hmm. So they're collecting these things, but then they're shoving it back to the site owner as data. Yeah. So if you were to go to a site, um, they the, the browser could indicate to that site that what my that three you, topics are. Yeah, what the three topics are, and therefore, if you were to visit a site, maybe they'll put a travel ad, for example, in. Um, but those would get purged every three weeks, and uh, apparently, you can self-delete them. Well, you can imagine that somebody bound to come up with a tool to just right self-delete away. everything every six minutes. It, I guess it depends on whether or not you want to be targeted by advertising. You know, is it better to have an advertising experience? Because you need ads on the internet. Otherwise, a lot of it won't work because, you know, a lot of people need to be paid through that model. But it's a question of whether or not you wish to see things which in, you know, are indicative of what you've looked at on the internet over the last few weeks or not. Yeah, but I spend my whole day looking at a variety. I mean, I would only see technical stuff because that's all yeah. I see all the day. Yeah, that's right. Or that, I don't know, maybe you'd go to that sock website or something and suddenly it's like, ooh, that's a bit unusual. Socks, now Bet's all into socks, is she? Let's give her socks for the next three weeks. But it's curious oh. that it's just like on the browser, three weeks at a time. I feel that they're scrabbling around trying to find a solution to a problem which feels like the internet is deciding we don't want to be tracked and google are just trying to figure out ways to it already to... feels like some device is listening to me because all it just takes is mentioning to you know my spouse or a family member that i'm i'm thinking about something and then i start seeing ads for that everywhere i'm not without even searching yeah yeah I, really I gotta i've never had that moment ignorant. where the devices are listening there's a device right there that's a potentially listening device. And I've got the mic switched off. But I'm, I've heard all these hearsay stories of people who have the mic switched on and they talk, you know, they're not interacting with the device, but they talk in their house. And then suddenly they are very, very coincidentally presented with all sorts of things about that particular subject. The litmus test, I guess, would be to talk for like only a few short minutes about something you've never spoken about before in your life, but is incredibly lucrative and see what happens. Groundhogs. Yeah, that's it. Oh, Lord. No. Groundhog gonna... recipes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, or NFTs. There you go. NFTs. Oh, <laughs> It's Todd. Hi, Todd. Yes, you. we mentioned you earlier. Uh, you'll have to go back about half an hour. We spoke about your wonderful survey, um, but yes, we did. Uh, you please do devote your, or donate, I should say, your photos picture. That would be really nice. Um, and what is that? Todd saying that's an NFT, Nathan. Flack for flock. <laughs> I'm going to be rich. Rich, there's another thing I don't understand. Okay, right. We're getting towards the end. I was going to mention a few things. Firstly, Michelle, you're up. Mm -hmm. What's this? WP Career Summit. I already have a... We've been launched the site a week ago last Friday. And we have 110 people signed up to attend already. I'm super thrilled. I have 20 applicants for speaking, although some of them did not understand the assignment because they started some suggesting topics like uh, PHP for WordPress. And I'm like, well, that's really not about career stuff. So thanks, Oh, no. no thanks. I'll read the form. Please read the form. Yes, right. I mean, like, read the room, read the form, like, just anything. Be self-aware. And um you know, we've already got some people um, interested in sponsoring as well. So super excited about this April 8th um, from 9 to 5 Central Time 
here in the States. Uh, and of course, anybody can register. It is free to attend and uh, completely covered by our sponsorships. I'm super excited about it. Uh, any questions, people can DM me on Slack. I'm in 5 million Slack channels. Or you can DM me on Twitter. My, my DMs are always open. Michelle, so. serious question. How do mm -hmm. you cope with so many Slack channels? And I'm not being facetious. I, ge I genuinely haven't got a process for And I'm in about four. And I can't figure out how to be notified, if you know what I mean, successfully. So I've got four tabs open, all with the different Slack channels. How do I'm you using the desk it? app. So if you use the desk app, it's all um, in the browser. Place. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. If I had to do it in the browser, I could never do it. But yeah, it's no. open. It's in a, in the desk. I have a Mac. It's right there. I've got the the desk app for it. it, and I'm. It's a lot easier. Okay. <laughs> the phone app isn't too bad either. Yes. No, I use the phone app as well. Although I try to, I turn off most notifications so that when I am on my own personal time, <laughs> I'm not constantly checking. So there's like a second Nathan Slack app in the app store, by the way, that is meant for like enterprise companies that like require a different level of authentication, but you can essentially run two separate slacks on your phone. Oh, cool. Oh, that is yeah. nice. So yeah. you can have the non-notification lot like, and then the notification lot. Ah. It, well, exactly. Like, so like I have a bunch of social slacks and so you have like the work slacks and the personal slacks, and then you can use, like oh, I use an iPhone, you can set up your personal focus to only show you the fun slacks. And then, wow. like, your work focus mode to only show you the work slacks. Yeah, that is good. Uh, good every good single one of my slacks is WordPress related. So there you yeah. go. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's a lot. Like, there's a lot of them. Yeah. Yeah. Todd's got the perfect yeah. the antidote to this whole problem. He just says he ignores them all. Like, oh, that's, that's, uh, that's brilliant. Uh, no, I think just, he says you are. <laughs> oh, does he? Oh, how, how Nathan is ignoring Nathan, most of them. Oh, maybe it's me. Yeah, that's that's what know. it is. Okay, no. It's open no. to interpretation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm going with Todd. <laughs> um, and yeah, yep, you also using uses the desktop. Todd's, yeah. Todd's using the desktop. And so does Rob. Well. Rob says the yeah, same Yeah, they're all thing. using the. Okay, well, maybe I need to do that. Mm -hmm. I had this kind of. I've got a fairly new Mac. It's about six months old, and I had this epiphany that I was going to install almost nothing on it, and just because you know, I just wanted to keep it lean and what have you. And I've managed broadly to do that. So it, most things like Slack end up in a browser because I don't have another thing to install. But um, seemingly unsuccessfully because I keep having to open up multiple tabs and I don't know which one's just kind of pinged me, but I hear the noise. And, um, oh, there you go. Peter was thinking about exactly that today, how to avoid work Slack on the phone while keeping the fun Slacks. Thank you. Uh, Tiffany, perfect answer. Excellent. What's it called? The enterprise version, or has it got a different name? Slack, EMM, something like that. If you search okay. for it in the, at least in the iOS store, and I think possibly Android, like Google yep. Play as well. Okay, um, that's really yeah. There's like a, there's just there's a second Slack app, and you uh, you can just use it to keep them separate. Yeah, that's good. Good advice. Cool. Okay, so um, WP Career Summit can be found at wpcareersummit.com. Um, put it in your diary. Eighth of April this year. I, so what? Wow. I built that site in less than twenty four hours. So nice, kind of mm -hmm. nice. Does it stay in the footer? <laughs> do, 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 do. Cadence. There you go. There mm -hmm. you go. Very nice. Okay, and you put Big Orange Chart in. Because of yeah, WordFest so Live. WordFest Another Live event. is coming up March 4th. I believe Bet is speaking at that. No, yes? I'm not. Um, no. Meg from our team is speaking on design Meg and accessibility. Meg is speaking. That's right. I remembered mm -hmm. somebody. I remembered you tweeting about it. Meg is tweeting about is uh, participating too. And uh, I don't know. Tiffany, are you part of that this time or not? I don't recall. Um, I've been working with uh, with the Nexus marketing team to figure out exactly what we're doing. So like, I'm awesome. involved, but I don't know how much yet. Gotcha. No problem. We're, yep. we're micro sponsoring though. Oh, nice. There's micro yeah. sponsoring opportunities. So that's always great. Yep. Let's open up the sponsorship. I actually, yeah. Yeah. But if you go to register now, yep, there you go. See, I actually micro sponsored as underrepresented in tech as well. There you go. Look yeah. at that. Mm -hmm. yeah, very yep. nice. Go yep. on. If I go where? What's that? Yeah. I th I, I, sorry. I thought you were going to direct me to a particular nope, page. No, nope, it's March 4th, 2022, so it's coming up in a little more than a month and 24 hours, lots of speakers, lots of great things. Um, and it costs, you know, We've got interviews, we've got live things happening, so it's just going to be another great event. It's our third one. Thank you. Yeah, brilliant. Mm -hmm. uh, Dan yeah. maybe is, um, is at the helm. 
and yes. doing stellar work, mm-hmm. keeping him very busy. I know that much. Mm-hmm. So um, 4th yeah. of March, put that one in your diary as well. So we've got mm-hmm. 8th, 8th of April, 4th of March. Yes. There we go. And to round off the show today, we're going to get into a thorny topic for five or Uh-oh. ten minutes. Something. Yeah, I know. Um, this isn't probably the best page to start with. Let's go over here. This is Bet's area of expertise. Bet, as was, mm. was mentioned right at the start, um, is very much into pushing website accessibility as a, as a concern. In the same way that I think that governance of pro- the WordPress project and all the things that we talked about a little while ago feels like that's the year for this. It feels like accessibility is really hit the mainstream and it's an important topic getting discussed like never before um but we have a bit of snake oil going on in the website communities tell us about this bet what's this twitter we do it's very interesting to me i mean a lot of it um so there are uh, what are called overlay plugins that are basically on the fly trying to correct uh, accessibility issues. There are some of them that purport to fix all of your accessibility problems and you know, just install our one line of code and everything will be hunky-dory. And of course that doesn't really work. Um, and so uh, there are uh, the, the link that uh, Nathan showed initially, um, overlayfactsheet.com gives you a whole, whole lot of information about what are the overlay plugins and why are they problematic? Part, partly, you know, if, if a person needs to have um, tools to be able to view websites, things like screen readers and magnifiers and those sorts of things, they already have them on their machine. So really these sorts of plugins that purport to give lots of tools and widgets for doing things are really sort of, um, not helpful because they're not the tools that the person has selected, but they also can conflict and cause neither tool to work. Uh, So a lot of problems, people with disabilities often will try to, uh, well, I I have uh, been in touch with people who block the IP address for the the tools like Accessibility so that they don't have to deal with them. People with disabilities rarely find them useful. And uh, but there's tons of money out there, lots of snake oil flying around. Uh, that's not a good image, huh? Um, but uh, <laughs> but uh, there's in the last week kind of been more of a public kerfuffle because the International Association of Accessibility Professionals (IAAP) um, is uh, has um, you know received into membership apparently some of these overlay plugins and now has started tweeting out. There's been a kind of an internal discussion about whether we wanted to do that, but then they've been uh, promoting their social media posts more recently. So it's been a little bit of an interesting kerfuffle, I think yeah. English well, would I, say, right? A kerfuffle. I, I had a really good conversation this week for a podcast, which is coming out on Wednesday. It's actually the WP Tavern podcast and uh, with Amber Hines. Mm, um, yes. And Amber has... Um, has a very similar range of interest to you. She she would like for all websites to be accessible and she wants to educate people um, in order to do that. And we we kind of got into the subject of what it is that you ought to be doing. And and then finally we got into the subject of why these solutions don't really fulfill that obligation. Could you just touch on that? What what is it about them that is so um, difficult to for you to swallow? Well, that they don't really work for people with, that are, with disabilities, right? Uh, that are are needing those accommodations. So the the they don't come in a good place in the tech stack. Um, they can uh, produce make things be unreliable. Um, so, for instance, they're using AI to determine a lot, you know, figure out where the problems are and try to correct them. And as we all know. AI is only going to make its best educated guess. AI only finds about 30% of accessibility issues to begin with. And a lot of accessibility issues really have to be contextually driven. So Amber actually had a great post on a, in a Facebook group that we were in this week um, where you can have the very same image. And depending on how you have used that image in your post, you might have really different um, alternative text for that image. Right. If the if the image is uh, uh, I think the image she posted was sort of like in a big urban area. If the if the image is sort of like on your about us page showing your office, that's going to have different alt text just sort of describing mm-hmm. the big urban area. But if you're if you're 
uh, putting that image in a post that's sort of describing sort of uh, urban uh, decline of uh, people having offices in urban areas, then you're going to emphasize that it's an empty space and there's no traffic there, right? So you you can have the same right. image but very different alt text, but AI can't know that. Yeah. Um, and so lots of problems with people not being able to get through forms, not being able to process things. JavaScript can make things um, unreliable in, in the ways that it's um, making changes to things. So just lots of problems with that. There are some tools that use AI to fix a limited number of things as an interim solution, and those are different, right? If you, if you know that you uh, have accessibility issues and you've you're in you know you received a lawsuit and you need to fix things quickly um, you may want to use one of those temporary solutions and you have 10,000 recipe posts that you've got to remediate right that's not going to happen overnight so you can use an interim solution to to fix that in the meantime but you know nothing beats doing accessibility uh, uh, right yeah well listen out for that blog post um, yes I'm I'm conscious that we've We're probably tired. overrun in terms yeah. of time, and I'm very sorry uh, for yeah, keeping worries. you guys for a few more minutes than than I I promised. But um, I think we will knock it on the head there. I can actually hear my door, uh, my outside door going, which probably indicates to me that my son has returned and is actually stuck <laughs> outside in one degree centigrade Britain. So I should probably go and rescue that poor chap. Um, so in which case. Would I be able to get you all to give me a bit of a wave? We do this thing where I get away from everybody. I don't know if Tiffany's good. Yay, there we go. Um, we'll be back this time next week. Thank you very much, Bet. Thank you very much, Michelle. And thank you very much, Tiffany. We'll um, we'll post this live. To, we'll post this out tomorrow, and I'll keep you guys updated. Thank you so much for your time. Take it good easy. Good to be with you again.